Hello. Oh. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> that probably helps, actually. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge that um, this being the final portion of the Tempe part of the event, and a lot of this event uh, focusing on the decolonizing of our practices and work around racial equity and justice, Liz and I wanted to acknowledge the <laughs> irony of having uh, two white East Coast Jews uh, be the closing conversation. Um, and just sort of note that, uh, that both of us, both before being here uh, and being here, um, uh, an analysis and actions around whiteness and white supremacy and white nationalism are part of what we think about in our practices. Uh, and, um, and just to sort of acknowledge that had we both been available together at another time during these couple days, it would feel more appropriate than being a beginning or ending to the conversation and centering whiteness the way it sort of represents. So just to say that aloud. And um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. And uh, I'm so glad to see you to the extent that I can see you in this room. Um, but I'm trying. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I also uh, just want to say as part of starting that um, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to the people who've been on this land that sustained this place for us to be here through their dances, through their creativity, through the rituals. Um, and uh, it does feel like a spiritual place. And it is a place in which my own Jewishness and our Jewishness lives in a particular thread through um, through the life here. Partly uh, being a desert people, it's been interesting to be in a place where people have visions, which I hope you've had. And if not here, maybe in Tucson, you'll get some. Uh, and um, uh, being a people who come with a, 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 a difficult history and relationship to land. And um, <clears throat> so I just offer this um, uh, one prayer, which, um, when I was a child, I just liked the sound of the Hebrew. It wasn't until much later, because I never really understood Hebrew. But the meaning of the prayer, it's a, um, it's a praise prayer. It's a, thank, a, a praise of thanks. And basically, it says, um, it thanks, um, thanks whatever larger presence you decide to thank, uh, for breath, for structure. I just love that there's a prayer that thanks something for structure. And then for the capacity to actually arrive at this moment. Um, so for me, it, I changed it into, isn't it amazing, given our histories, that we would actually be gathered here today, again, on this land that has been saved for us. And the Hebrew goes, Shehekianu v'kiamanu v'higianu l'asman hazeh. And uh, with that, Michael, let's move on, shall we? So, uh, yeah, I, get to, I have one. I get to start. Uh, so one of the um, great joys and privileges in my life the last couple years has been, like a lot of you, I've known um, Liz Lerman as a force, an artist, uh, a leader, a thinker, a choreographer, uh, and a master artist. And now, because we both live in the same place and got the invitation to come here and work together, I now know her as one of my dearest friends. So uh, I feel very fortunate <laughs> to get to uh, sit here and be in conversation, and I'm going to start by asking you a question that I feel like people don't ask you enough. They ask you about feedback, they ask you about ideas, they ask you about facilitation, but they don't just say, Liz Lerman, what are you working on creatively right now as an artist that you're really excited about, and how does that connect to the notion of ensemble practice, which is what gathers all of us in this community here together? Well, thank you for that question, Michael. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, somebody once asked me who I was most like, and I surprised them by saying John Cage, and they said, "What? <laughs> You're not anything like John Cage." I said, "Well, you know, people like John Cage's ideas. They didn't always like his art, but um, but he wouldn't have the ideas if he didn't make the art." And that's sort of how I feel a little bit. You can't have this. You have to like get in the thick of it again and again and again and again. So because that's the place where all the, um, the sort of raw stuff happens. 
Um, I'm, uh, a few years ago, I happened to be in Scotland actually teaching critical response. Uh, they're very eager over there. It was the puppet community that brought me, which I just love the puppets doing critical response. <laughs> but <laughs> it's pretty great. <laughs> but, step uh, one, step, step one. one. <laughs> you got it. But, um, <laughs> but I went to a museum, uh, uh, the big museum there, and they had an exhibit up called Wicked Bodies, which turned out to be 500 years of drawings of witches. And I have to say, I wasn't that interested in witches before I walked in, but by the time I walked out, I was completely and totally enthralled, astonished, and amazed. I thought, I need to work on this. And the, the, the funny thought I had at the time was, if I just bring to life a few of these drawings, it'll be the most pornographic piece I've ever made. <laughs> you cannot believe. And it's like, the other thought I had on leaving the exhibit is, Every time in history, every culture has its witches. And what is that about? And began to think sort of the underlying premise, I suppose this sort of, uh, the dr uh, one of the engines is, why is um, some knowledge celebrated, some knowledge erased, and some knowledge criminalized? And what is that process? And of course, we just observed a few weeks ago a woman become a witch right in front of us over the two years we saw, uh, two, two weeks we saw where she began at the beginning, even where she was at the end of, of I was gonna say the trial, and then um, how she was perceived after that, and who became the victim in the next week. So um, <clears throat> I've started working on it, and it's, um, <laughs> it's really interesting. I, I'll just say mm, as quickly as I can, because I, I, you know, I'm at that point right now where everything is possible, you know, all the ideas are good, everything's interesting. We haven't sort of flipped and started saying, well, it can't be this, it can't be that. It's, and to be honest, this is one of these pieces where I know I'm gonna make something and it's going to be in some kind of theatrical place and it will probably tour and that the structure of that, remember, grateful for structure, is a good thing. But this time, a lot of the stuff I'm putting on the cutting room floor, I don't really like keeping there. It feels too powerful, too important, too interesting, and therefore requiring some additional, beyond the usual things where we would tour and there'd be, pan, you know, you'd have panel discussions or you'd, you know, you'd do workshops. This time I feel like uh, I've got to figure out way more um, activities sooner because it's just so pertinent. I will say though that uh, three, three, there are three realms in the piece. One is the realms of the witches themselves, and there's we're having a great time with the major and minor witches, the witch of forgiveness, the witch of bitterness, the witch of ambiguity, the witch of the tiniest things, the witch of old libraries, the witch of, I mean, anything going on for you right now, just put the witch in front of it, you'll have a great time. It's really incredibly generative. We start every rehearsal in a circle, what witch are you today? And it's just amazing. <laughs> what could, could you take a second and say who's the we? So, yes, because I don't have a company anymore. You know, I left the, the beautiful Dance Exchange, which is doing great, great work. They're a wonderful ensemble in their 40th year, and they're doing just fine without me, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but I've gathered some artists together, um, people that I've known over time. Um, maybe uh, it's been an interesting question, because as I said, every culture has its witches. And... Um, is this a time and a place to bring different cultures together in a space, and can a white person do that? As a leader, you mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's a witch of whiteness, and one thing she does is collect other people's cultures, but it's also been proposed that perhaps I'm that person, although, and there's a certain way in which that could be true, so, so trying to work through that. But one of the ways I've decided to, so I have some amazing partners um, <coughs> from my own history and people I've known including Nia Love, some of you may know Nia Love's work. She's extraordinary and her daughter Makada is also in the piece. Nia and I knew each other when she was very small because I knew her father, Ed Love. So there's like a, um, a sensation of love in our relationship that I think makes it possible. But I will say, so the world of the witches, there's um, the world of the trials. And this is like the fifth time I've done a piece where the, the fact that, uh, as I like to, when if you think about the historic period when the witches were all burned and drowned, the church riled everybody up, but it was the state that did the killing. It was legal, and this is the thing that I want to do with this piece, is to make it clear that even though there are laws, they are not legal. I mean, they're not right, 
and what do, how do we address that? And then the third world, and this is what is, I think, for the moment, given me permission to try to get at some of this, is um, there's uh, two uh, scientists here on campus who heard me speak and we got together, and they're working on something called productive ambiguity. Is that great? No, they got NSF money, and they think ambiguity is, is uh, actually leads to efficiency. I, I, we don't have time to go into it all right now, but, <laughs> but they, they um, I, I, there's somebody is collecting witches in this piece. I think they're going extinct. And I think that the collector is collecting them in order either to own their beauty or to save their knowledge for the future or to figure out what they know or to try to categorize the knowledge and how that all works. So I think there's room in there to try to pull these, mis these misunderstandings into the present somehow. So anyway. Have you read Neil Gaiman's American Gods? No, I haven't. I, I, am, I, am I off or might there be something interesting in that? Would I like that? that? It's, okay. I mean, it's different, but this notion of historical figures and legends and how they get pulled into the world and intersect with morality and politics. Oh, I, I love that. You have Maybe to come that. One yeah. last thing. We just had a rehearsal period, and just because we're going to get into uh, creative tools in a little bit, I pulled out a really old tool that I haven't used in a long time, and I realized even though I was working with this incredibly group of amazing professionals, they probably didn't know this tool either. So when, um, I'll just say, you, you all use this tool in some way or another. In my case... When my mother died, uh, uh, and I was so young, the only thing I knew how to do when I was making this dance about her was, you know, dance my feelings because that's what I knew how to do. But one day I went into rehearsal and I wasn't sad anymore, and I just didn't know what to do, and I just I didn't know what to do, and so I uh, put myself in a sad shape, and I said, "Okay, what's going on? Oh, look, my back is curved, my focus is down, my my digits are splayed." Oh, and I made a little score for sadness, and then I messed around. How many ways could I curve my spine? How many ways could I change it? How many ways could I stretch my, uh, you know, my joints? And came up with this material that I would never have made if I had to be sad or pretend to be sad. So that, I went into rehearsal this week. I'm in a rage. So many of the people I know are in a rage. I knew, I, you know, we weren't going to go in and pretend to be rageful. So we, we built us, we did rage, seething, and that angry person over there. And we put ourselves in those positions. <laughs> we figured out what's the, what's the score in the body? What's the body saying? And then everybody went around the room and made these. I, you cannot believe the material that people made. It's utterly different and fantastic. And then we broke it up, because I wanted to edit it. We broke it up into the letters of the alphabet. So A, B, C. And then they began to do spells with, <laughs> with this stuff. So anyway, stay tuned. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you one other question about that? Um, because I, there's so many folks in the room here. I mean, there's how many folks in here sort of say that dance is the primary discipline that brings you into this conversation? Oh, hi, guys. And then theater? A lot, yeah, and then and then who doesn't wouldn't go either, but would say a different kind of cross disciplinary or connected, yeah, others. Okay, so so I I, I want to ask when you talk about you know this material was made, and then you had to decide how you wanted to edit it and things. A lot of folks in here explore different forms of collaboration and authorship and what happens in the room. What's your work with this kind of pickup company that's become more than that? Like, how do you talk about and uh, and operate? authorship around material that happens in the space? So this is a big part of what happens when people enter into the relationship with me. Um, I've said in this particular piece, even though 30 or 40 years ago when I would write in the program kind of choreographed by Liz Lerman in collaboration with the performers, which 30, 35 years ago was something people hadn't seen, and then we would list everybody. In this piece, I don't actually think that's enough. Uh, it might be that uh, conceived and organized by or shepherded by, but then the term shepherd isn't quite right either. Uh, but what is the role of all the makers in the room? I also have agreements with everybody that anything they make, they can take back for, to, for themselves to use in whatever they wish, uh, acknowledging the origin point. Even the editing, though, I'm not always the editor. We, we pass all that stuff around constantly. But the naming of that activity feels really important to me. And I don't know if it all fits on the front cover of a playbill. You know, 
and I don't know if it's actually a, a description inside or even the way we characterize ourselves. So with this particular group, which includes some people from the city company uh, and um, I'm Leah Cox, who some of you may know. I'm just extraordinary. I, I don't know how that's going to go. But it feels very contribut contributory. However, I am raising the money. I'm organizing the rehearsals. I'm paying people. I am probably a synthesizer, so maybe there's that. Hard to say. Thank you. That mm -hmm. feels like a complexity that a lot of folks in here think. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. So how about you, Michael? What are you working on? What's your craves? And I would say the same intro, right? People ask you, how do you facilitate? How do you, what are you working on? Um, yeah, um, I am uh, one of the things, so I'm part of a theater company called Sojourn Theater. We're just about 20 years old. There's 15 of us. Uh, we live in seven different cities and are constantly, so unlike a lot of companies here, we are no longer place-based. We are uh, company-based and we work in lots of different places on projects. So like this year, we have, have had projects going on in Cleveland and here in Arizona and in the Twin Cities and in Chicago. Different combos of us work. One of the projects that we have going on now is a piece called um, Don't Go that um, I think a lot of my um, creative brain is on these days. Uh, Don't Go is an evolution of a piece we started about three years ago, which was called Work With Me. And Work With Me was going to look at collaboration in communities between unlikely suspects across ideological divides. And it kind of had a, it had a sort of narrative kind of story-ish flow. And, uh, and then the election happened in 2016, and um, it felt soft. Uh, it felt soft in terms of the way that it got into the challenges of the divides and the way that we uh, stay and go. So we um, sort of thought about how to remake the idea. Something I've been really interested in for a, a long time, especially the last decade, is um, not just making things that happen up here and folks sit out there in the dark and watch. Uh, I've become far more interested and have practiced much more lately in uh, events that are aimed at encounters amidst the folks out here, as opposed to an encounter between this and this. So whatever this is, which might actually be out there, is about making encounters happen that might not happen otherwise. With that goes an, a layer of audience design. That's not so interesting, that stranger encounter, if you've got a lot of folks coming from really similar perspectives and backgrounds. So we take on, as part of our creative practice, uh, who's in the room, not just what we're making, but who we're making it for and with. Um, so this piece uh, basically started with the, the, the simple concept of, let's make a piece where the performers actually exist to bring strangers into dialogue with each other um, across uh, unlikely sp spaces and moments. So uh, we two things happened. We got some commission support here at ASU Gamage, which uh, Liz also has for Wicked Bodies. Both of us have a, a bit of support here. Uh, and that's allowed me to bring some Sojourn artists in and out the last year, and that'll happen again this year. But we also got invited to USC last spring in Los Angeles, and we did a, a six-week residency where four company artists were there and built a prototype of act one of the piece with undergrads not theater majors, actually. It turned out that the students who were most interested in this were not the theater students. It actually turned out to be an incredibly interesting and really diverse group of students from all over campus who came together and were the, the core ensemble. And uh, this piece, Act One, was uh, seven people meeting seven strangers, and the 80 minutes of the show was simultaneously seven pairs of human beings who'd never met building relationships through tasks and conversations, and then using lighting and amplification and architecture, choosing which pair the audience would witness at which points, and then giving the audience the opportunity to sort of focus in on the pair they were most interested in. And the, the strangers were curated. We call them a stranger chorus. And USC had committed to helping us find the Stranger Chorus. We worked for half a year sort of mentoring them into doing that, and, uh, and they couldn't um, because they didn't have experience at engaging beyond their campus. 
uh, and the theater department themselves, it turned out, who were wonderful to us and great to work with, did not necessarily have the skills to build those relationships in the context of a performance event or what we were trying to curate. So we ended up hiring two organizers in Los Angeles who one of our artists was deep friends with. And those organizers in three weeks put together a stranger chorus of 49 people for us. <laughs> and those strangers were multi-generational, um, diverse identity-wise in many ways. Uh, and the show then became seven strangers walking out on stage in the beginning to meet the seven performers. And then this 80-minute event would happen. And it was really exciting and great. And at the end of it, um, uh, the lead artists on this project are Rebecca Martinez, Nikki Zaleski, and myself, and John o Island uh, as well. And at the end of it, we went, that was great. That's not the thing. Where we got them to at the end, that's not at all satisfying. And we realized it's actually a larger three-act event. And we are... Um, can, I, can I just ask you, how did you know it wasn't... I mean, what, disappoint, what, what was it that made you feel that wasn't the place to be? The aspiration of the piece, that iteration, was to get two strangers to a moment of conversation around a topic that they absolutely disagreed on and to invite them to the moment of, do you want to stay in this conversation or do you want to go? And the piece got them to the moment of, I want to stay or go, and then a little bit beyond. And it was so clear that, that we hadn't actually, we hadn't done the work to go as deep into that relationship as we wanted. And it just sort of kept feeling topical and not, not human beneath the topical. So it didn't feel emotionally resonant. And in this moment, it felt like a little bit, a little bit replicative of what you can catch on a better version of a punditry show on television. You know, different points of view, mm -hmm. even though it was more personal and, and human, it, it, didn't, it didn't feel satisfying. Mm -hmm. And what we realized we hadn't done was, although the audience had witnessed, the theatrical event was watching these pairs go through a dramaturgy, but these human beings had not gone through creative experience together. The creative experience was structured around them, and the audience had an experience of aesthetics, but the people had an experience on stage of getting to know someone amidst urgency. And it was really exciting, and they loved doing it, but what we realized was they need to create together. Mm -hmm. So I, I literally, the next to last performance, we were driving uh, uh, back to where people were staying, and I looked at Jono and I said, oh, the second act is those those strangers need to go through a 40-minute version of Antigone, or whatever the classic play is, and they need to be the performers, and they need to be instruction shepherded through it by the performers. So at the end of Act Two, you have watched these strangers and these sojourn performers tell the story of a classic struggling dramatic conflict and reconciliation. And then the third act returns to the end of the first act, which is literally at the end of act one, these two people are in a moment, and it's, do you want to stay or go? And then before they can answer, they are whisked into Antigone or whatever it is, and those two people become the protagonists. And then at the end of act two, they are returned to the same architectural space and orientation, and they're asked again, after having gone through that tale, do you want to stay or go? And then act three begins. And act three then continues on into a dialogue between these two human beings. So we're now, we're working on that iteration. Um, and we're going to work on it here this year. Some of you might know uh, LaGuardia Performing Arts Center and Stephen in Queens. We're going to do a little bit of work with him probably on that this year. We're going to be in Nashville for two weeks on it next fall. And then it's hopefully, seems like maybe, going to happen at a festival a year and a half from now, and then it'll be back here two years from now at ASU Gambit. So, Michael, I sort of op started with this idea that, um, you know, John Cage makes his work, but it's the, the ideas come from that. Yeah. So given what you just told us about this piece, that you're in the middle of it, that you had already a session where, wait, it's not this, it's going to go yeah. here, is that forcing you to have to reconceive any of your own thinking, um, how you're thinking, or what it's, you know, what edge is that putting you on? For, for me, making stuff, making theater, uh, is never like a, I know what I want to express and I will spend a year working to express it. Like, and, and there are certainly directors I deeply admire whose job for them is to interrogate the play, figure out a vision, and then work to express it. I have very little interest in that, which is why I only 
generally make original work because I'm interested in a question or an inquiry or a subject and going on a journey and then finding out what form that journey leads to in terms of an expressive experience and an encounter amidst the people in the room. And that might look like a play, it might look like participation, it might look like a tour, it might look like all kinds of things. So it hasn't changed my thoughts about like the aesthetics of it. What it, what it has done is this project going parallel to the deep shit we're in, um, in the world, which let's also acknowledge is not different from a lot of deep shit we've been in for a very long time, but there's a particular manifestation of the shit right now that's, that's pretty um, intensely uh, present. Um, I'm trying to figure out how the show doesn't become beholden to that narrative, but how the project contributes something to how human beings encounter each other that is um, useful given that shit. Um, so that's probably what's been iterating idea-wise and trying to wrestle with, which gives me a chance to come to a different question for you. Okay. Does that sound right? Yeah, and we just want you guys to know in a little bit we're going to stop for whatever's on your minds that's brewing. might be questions. It might be pictures in your head. It might be whatever, but we, we'll, we'll be there soon. <laughs> okay. Is this okay that we just talk to each other for a couple of minutes? Yeah. Is this all right? Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, okay. So... Um, we're both at a ginormous institution right now, ASU. <laughs> but both, both Liz and I, um, although sort of different generations, have both started organizations uh, because we couldn't find what we were interested in in the sectors or fields that our discipline would seem to take us into. There are other people in the room for whom that is the case. Um, and we are now working in, by far, uh, kind of the most gargantuan institution in the state of Arizona. Uh, and the largest institution either of us have been this deeply engaged in and paid by before. So like, it's super complex to be here. And I know some of that's already come up in conversations over the couple days, the challenges of that and also the magic of that. So I thought we wouldn't spend a ton of time on the challenges, but you can grab any of us and talk about that. <laughs> but there's a particular thing that you are really leading on and that we are both working on in relation to um, how lived experience and skills and tools and approaches make their way out accessibly into the world beyond rooms that we are together in. And I wonder if you want to talk about that. Yeah, um, yeah. We, we won't go into the whole thing at the university now, except um, I'll just say, being an older person coming to the university, there is a certain magic to it. I mean, they give you a computer, they give you an office, the bathrooms work. You get a you get a paycheck every two weeks. When we you first got here, raise. the bathroom. I just can't get over. Can it. we just say the bathroom? <laughs> when the we bathroom. first got here, as I was moving here a couple months after her, bathroom. she called me and said, "There is a bathroom here that I don't have to clean up or put toilet paper in. It is it's here." Amazing. That was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a certain just am amazement of of the kinds of things that resources that you know and yeah. So I'm grateful for all that. Um, I think I'm kind of an obsessive tool maker, probably more than anything. I've been that. And I'm not sure if that's uh, the nature of the relationship between teaching and making and how that keeps sites spiraling around. You figure out, you start sharing what you know. Oh, you don't really know it. Oh, how can I make this more experiential than it is? No, I don't want to tell you. I want to build an experience. I think a lot of it has to do with the um, magnificent uh, way in which I was able to spend time with n not just trained professional dancers who I love, but actually to be in hospitals and schools and prisons and things like that, made me have to reconceive the molecules of the idea. It's the same idea. It's like ice water, you know, fog, rain. I mean, it's all the same stuff, but, you know, it changes its thing when you're in different places. And, and because of that, I think I began to grasp these essential elements um, and hang on to them and notice that if I had figured out what that was, I actually could put it aside and go find something else new. That if I hadn't done that, I just repeated myself. There's something counterintuitive there that the more you name the thing, the more you're actually able to step away. And so over the years, I've attempted all these different m manifestations of how to get these tools into the hands of people because it turns out they're really useful. <laughs> and they might be useful for ma art, making art. They are. 
But they're also used for all kinds of other things, having meetings or you know, making dinner or having a congregation or do whatever. So trying to, and trying to make something better, how to listen, how are you sure, wait a minute, how do you handle mistakes you've made, all, all that stuff. So uh, when I was recruited here, I was in the midst of trying to sort out if I could put this into a digital framework. And I believe when I last talked at NET, that was where I left the ending of the talk, was I was just starting to figure that out. I'm still just trying to figure it out. Um, uh, I have been given some support here to build a team. And because the way you get things done here is to teach a course, this thing called the Atlas of Creative Tools has had its first um, hybrid meaning I see them once a week, but they do a lot of the work online. I'm heading into a full semester where it'll be fully online and trying to develop. Uh, so this is what, what I think right now is I think the digital space is incredibly creative, full of possibility. It is not the same as being in the presence of somebody. But there is stuff you can do there that's pretty fantastic. And uh, oddly enough, some of the stuff that people like is the way I teach is, you know, people will I'll say, well, you know, we'll do something, and then I'll say to people, what did you find out? And then they'll say something. And because they say that thing, then that's what I'll talk about. I don't have it planned in advance. But all that stuff goes into the ether. <laughs> they can go back and find it because it's sort of all there. You know, you can look up, what was that 30-second lecture on comfort zone? What was that? What was, you know, stuff like that. So I like that part. Um, I missed uh, trying to sort out how to find out what people are actually experiencing is problematic. But anyway, we're experimenting with this. My hope is that eventually the Atlas of Creative Tools will live as a as a place for artists to uh, have their own neighborhoods that you could you could put your tools in to these mm, particular maybe templates. It's not quite a template really that the tools could live in a sequence, but they could also migrate. So if somebody typed in, say they wanted to get listening tools, you know, yours would migrate as well as mine. I think there's actually a financial possibility in how this could work, like Spotify or something, where you know, you might get a penny a tool or something like that. Because, you know, I know that for a lot of us, this is, this is the heart of our knowledge. It's like I keep saying to artists, I, I sell my knowledge, not my dances. I sell this, th I, what people want is the way we think and act and behave. And I only come to that through making my work. And I love it when people come and see these dances. But the rest of this is just as real and just as powerful and just as critical. And I think this, again, historically, there are times where you have to retreat to the caves and keep this thing private because that's the only way to save it for the next generation. But we're not in that time right now. We're in a time where this stuff needs to be in the hands of people. And I'm hoping this would work. And the second reason I hope artists would eventually want to put, put their things in there too is because you'd be able to see who's using them. You'd be able to say, look, this many people checked in on the way that I'm working on this right now. And I think as we seek ways of how to acknowledge our own work, and the role that acknowledgement plays for us. I think there's something in there that's way beyond social media likes, way beyond that that we don't understand. So that's what I'm working on here. And th there are lots of issues with it, lots of problems, but I won't go into all that. But you have, and Michael's joined me in this now. Yeah. Yeah, um, how many, are there, are there some of the students from my civic practice class in here? There they are. Yeah, hey, few. guys. Hi, yeah. hey guys. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm teaching a course right now on civic practice. I have about 20 students, mostly grad students, a few undergrads as well. Um, and that's a, a course looking at artists and designers, culture makers and heritage holders collaborating uh, in and with communities. And particularly looking at sort of the idea that I've been working on for a while around civic practice and um, a, a kind of portion of the spectrum of how artists engage that looks at artists deploying their assets in collaboration with community self-defined aspirations and visions and challenges. Uh, and that course is kind of looking at what, what are the ethics of partnership? What are the muscles of listening? What capacity building uh, is required for artists? And what sort of uh, preparation and relationship building happens 
uh, in communities with residents and organizations. And that course is going to be a, a, a hybrid course next fall, meaning folks are going to take it live and they're going to take it online. And there'll be a number of, uh, of some live interactions, but uh, more virtual interactions. And then the goal is eventually for that to move <laughs> online. But I'll tell you the thing that I feel like Liz and I are working most heartily on is something that, um, that hasn't been solved here or pretty much anywhere, I don't think yet. And there's the opportunity here because of all the uh, brilliant folks around here doing the technology and AR and VR and XR and all that kind of work. Uh, there, is, there are very few examples, maybe outside of the medical profession right now, where digital technology is being used to explore the learning that happens in embodied practices. Um, how does knowledge that is about bodies in space get communicated? Most of the online work happening is helping someone figure out how to translate knowledge into videos, assignments, discussion boards, lectures, and that stuff. And that really can be very useful in, in knowledge areas. If you're working ultimately <laughs> with Liz Lerman on dance making, facilitation, group process, ultimately the standards of hear her speak and get some written discussion going is not going to necessarily approximate that experience. Um, and I feel the same way for work that's around relational kind of artist community practice. Um, and I'll tell you an example that you may or may not have heard of to give you where, where we're trying to raise money to go. Um, in Kansas a couple years ago, the School of Education, University of Kansas, explored a course that was for principals of public high schools around the United States. They could take it virtually. And the nature of the course was to help them build just and collaborative school environments. The way the course worked was they created an avatar, a fictional identity, and they entered a simulated world of a public high school in an unnamed American city. And the instructor, the teacher, acted as the dungeon master, so to speak, and basically game ran an immersive eight-week experience. And the plot was the school had lost its federal funding because of a civil rights violation. And this school had to rebuild its relationships in the building and outside the building with the community to re-achieve federal funding status. And these principals went through in character having to negotiate relationships and get feedback and get challenged. Some of the relationships were, you know, in animated video game world. Some were um, uh, sort of live chats where avatars kind of took over their identities, but they were actually doing the interactions. The feedback they got on this course in terms of the learnings and how the learnings were then implemented in the school buildings was astronomically high. And I am sitting in a room with a group of people who, like, build experiences and encounters, and work with dramaturgy and narrative, and understand relationship and dynamics. And there are people who aren't us, who are the pioneers of building out that field. And that's a sore miss on our part, and it's a sore lack on the part of those things getting built. So, you know, how, 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 is new, how are the playwrights you know, not contributing the scenarios and the dramaturgies? How are the divisors not contributing the way that generative space gets occupied and led in these moments? So um, we're pushing for the folks here who work on gamification and immersive worlds and multi-platform simulations. How can we work with them on taking online education to a place beyond knowledge dissemination towards transformative experience in the virtual world? Which, in terms of access and equity, is massively important because there will just never be the resources, time, or space for everyone to be in the room with everyone who could share useful transformative knowledge with them. The same way that surgeons around the world are now being trained by like three trauma doctors based in Chicago and Detroit. You know, how, how, do, we, how do we engage that? So I'm, that's the thing I'm really thinking about and doing some pushing on here. And uh, since, Michael, since you started also with this word ethics, I just want to add that um, for me, there's some um, troubling considerations around thinking about all of these creative tools without also thinking about, I'll use the term ethics, but it has to do with, for example, uh, our president. Um, for me, one of the um, 
one of a, 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 a creative principle might be this, multiple words for the same thing. And when you, get, when you can give people ideas about how that works, you can see all kinds of ways that uh, you can mediate problems. But we have, a, we have a president for whom multiple words for the same thing or multiple things for the same word. Uh, he, you know, he changes it every single day. And I'm beginning to think that um, l putting these incredibly powerful tools out without also thinking about how they are applied and in what way they are used and by whom and how is actually uh, really scary. Or, for example, ambiguity or multiple truths. Um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, four definitions of truth in order for them to do their work. It's brilliant. It's fantastic. And when I was living in Baltimore during the uprising, you could see how those four definitions of truth worked every single day to help people through that. But that's not what we mean by the kind of truth we're living in now. So I, I, uh, I think in addition to all the things you just named about what kind of immersive worlds can we create is how are we going to bring to bear these kinds of ideas too. So um, <clears throat> do you want to just move to the, that then? Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the social justice and equity work? Yeah. Which one? And then I'll think about, yeah, why don't you go? Um, well, one of the things I, I was talking about with Liz, I, I imagine a lot of folks in here spend a lot of energy thinking about process. Yeah, um, yeah, and and you know, so do so do we. Um, and I, I feel like I, if I'm having to sort of define the thing that I that I want to be thinking about and and writing about and, and working on a lot, and Jerry and I have talked a lot about process over the years. I'm just going to keep name checking you because everybody name checks you, so why not add more <laughs> to, to the beautiful Jerry? Um, but process conversation uh, feels really um, crucial. And I had an experience a couple weeks ago um, that connects this for me to the to the, the conversations around social justice that we're also engaged in and the work of it. So my, my Sojourn's almost 20 years old, but I'm also part of a center that's seven years old, and we're in a transition moment right now. Uh, the center, uh, I've been the artistic director, and Sunila Nankani, who's been my collaborator for years and years, has been the managing director, and the organization has just promoted her to executive director. So we're in a leadership transition. Uh, my title has shifted to lead artist for civic imagination. Um, which I get to make up and I like. Um, but Sunila is now the executive director. And in that transition, she is taking on that role because she is absolutely the best candidate for that job. Her skills, her experience, her excellence, um, she is the candidate for that job. We would be, we couldn't find a more ideal candidate. And she's a woman of color. And so in a transition, of an organization going from what is the dominant model in our arts and culture sector of a white guy, right, who's a founder also, to a woman of color becoming leader, there are assumptions that we sort of made internally a little bit about the ease with which we would do that, given that a lot of our work externally focuses on racial equity and social justice and gender, and that's a lot of the work we do as facilitators. Uh, but actually, it turns out, there's lots of moments in the ways that we interact that are pretty coded, visibly and invisibly, in terms of those very dynamics. And so, in the last month in particular, um, we've been in this process of um, holding each other and certainly holding me accountable for moments around those dynamics, moments around gender, moments around race, moments around age. Uh, and process-wise, what we find ourselves talking about is um, we feel really lucky because we have two things that we're starting to feel like are very necessary for healthy process around some of the really challenging and necessary m conversations of this moment. We have love and we have tools. Love without tools means there's effort, but maybe not necessarily the capacity. Capacity without love maybe means that one grows tired of the effort and is it really worthwhile. So we have felt fortunate as we move through it and as I sometimes get called out and then called back in and as we kind of work together that 
love and tools are present. And then we start thinking, what about all the spaces that we work in? All the spaces that we work in where there's the desire and the knowledge that change needs to happen, but there's maybe not love and tools simultaneously. How do we help build capacity for love and tools in our ensembles and in the spaces that we are welcome within? And I'm, I'm learning a lot about that from my colleagues and really trying to do the work of uh, figuring that out um, from my angle. I haven't heard you say that. That's really, really uh, uh, a beautiful way of putting it. Um, Michael will tell you when I came here, I wanted them to uh, let me have a lab called the Lab for Risk, Purpose, and Love. Um, and I was told that actually love wouldn't work here on the campus, but <laughs> could I use empathy? I said no. Um, and, uh, but there's some reconsidering going on right now about the use of that word. So, um, uh, in, in relationship to this idea about love and tools, I'll, uh, I'll add um, my own personal way of think seeing the world divided right now. And I think, so, I think some of you may have heard me say this before. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's the reworking of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle where, where uh, you know, um, this is not truly what it is. This is my version of it uh, reworked many times. But in, the, in that principle, Heisenberg says, you know, if you measure the shape of something, you will miss the momentum or the velocity. And if you go for the velocity, you will miss the shape. I find this really interesting because I actually think artistic practice rehearsals, dance in particular, is one of those few places where actually shape and momentum is a fairly consistent thing back and forth, back and forth, and you get skilled at moving between them, which you have to do. Most of our institutions, including this one, are shape conscious. They're in a shape, and you can't feel the urgency and the momentum of the times in that shape. You have to, you have to let it um, decompose and then find its new shape, but not too sharp a shape because it's going to have to decompose again. And, and the thing, you know, for a while I was saying it's easy. It's like water, ice, uh, you know, it's just like that. Except, you know, that takes, it takes effort. It takes effort to move between the water and ice. It takes effort. It takes energy, and like actual energy. physical energy. Energy. I know science. And heat. <laughs> So I'm, I find myself often, when I think about change, f looking quickly in the room, what's happening? Where are the shapes being held? Where's the momentum? What's, you know, understanding you need both. You can't live only in momentum. No one will see it. They won't know what you're talking about. You need the shape to see it. Um, the other thing I just wanted to bring to process, and then and maybe we'll see where this goes, but I, um, I just got back from Utrecht, the university there, which is a, uh, the arts university in Utrecht, where they, they're interested in applying the critical response process. What nation is Utrecht in? In the, in the Netherlands. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I had met some of these folks at another conference, and they're, they're wild researchers and wonderful artists and doing, it, 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 it's really interesting climate over there. Um, <clears throat> And so we were working on the critical response process, which they have decided they want to put throughout the entire university. I'm not going to go into the whole process now. Some of you know it, some of you may not. But it's undergoing a lot of change right now, and partly uh, as people use it for so many different things. Like you may know, the original idea was critical response was a way to get feedback. And f good feedback was defined as, I can't wait to go back to work. Well, actually, I can't wait to go back to work in the studio. But what came up in Utrecht is, well, wait a minute. What's the work you're going back to? It might not be what you're doing in the studio. It might be how you are as a white man in a particular room. That's the work right now. What is the work of it? So in the second step of critical response, the artist asks questions. That's the plan, and if you know the system, you know, and the answer, once an artist asks a question, the responders can answer however they want, as long as they stay on topic, you cannot change the subject, right? So I could say to you, what do you think about my ending of my dance? You could say to me, it's terrible. You could say it's fine, but you couldn't say, Liz, the ending's fine, but your hair is stupid. You can't change the subject, which is at the heart of feedback in academia change the subject. 
That's like the way it goes. So honestly, same in families. Child asks you into, your, into his or her room for help with their homework, does not give you permission to tell them to clean up the room. It is not the contract of which that invitation was made. So listen, listen, listen. Liz told my daughter that. That did not help. <laughs> Remember, yeah. It's fantastic for parents, too. It's, yeah, you'll be very grateful, Michael, <laughs> that, I told, that I told her that. Um, but what, what, what we got into, and, and the reason I'm bringing it up here, is that in, you know, when you say what, they really wanted to work on how artists ask questions. And I said to them, you know, it doesn't always come in the form of a question. The problem doesn't come already made as a question. It comes as a worry. Oh, oh we're losing, uh, going to school. I think you just upset a lot of people. Uh, they have to. <laughs> no, they have to go to class. Goodbye, you guys. Thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to think that every time people leave the theater. Oh, they're freshmen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They got a class to go to. It's, yeah. it's an angry, white, 69-year-old male freshman. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Should we turn out to them? And yeah, I just the saw, finish this just to say, yep. the inquiry doesn't come always as a question. It comes as a worry, an obsession, a doubt, a hope, a dream. And that our capacity to turn those things into inquiry is really this beautiful little space because you know the students will ask art school questions. They won't ask what's really in there until we allow that to emerge. And I thought that might be going on here too. So we're we're opening it out now for questions. But in case you've got worries, doubts, obsessions, hopes, dreams, we're happy for those too, as you uh, raise what you want to raise with us. And I think we're doing good, aren't we? Yeah, we're fifteen or twenty minutes. That's great. Well, I, I, no, I, I actually want to start by saying the transition you made at Dance Exchange is sort of a very visible, exemplary kind of moment of a founder helping an organization move on and survive and thrive. So maybe you might want to talk about that for a moment. And, and I do just want to say it's not just intergenerational. I mean, the nature of what people, the way people hold knowledge, uh, learn, discover, we used to joke at the dance exchange, we were old, white, gay, straight, married, widowed, divorced, Jewish, Christian. I mean, we were just such a, an amazing array of people. But what gave us the most trouble and would cause incredible anger is if a bug came into the rehearsal, whether we killed it or not, <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> distress. <laughs> it would end the rehearsal. Or the speed with which people learned something or when in the process they needed to know when we were going to the airport. I mean, pe people would just lose it over these things. So I just want to say that, um, yes, some of it's <laughs> generational, um, but there's so much else that goes on that causes what, and, and being able to pay attention and enjoy ourselves as we just did because we used to really, once we figured out about the bugs, we just, we just loved it. We would line people up on both sides <laughs> of the studio. No, it's like, oh, uh, but did the bugs live? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. <laughs> but in terms of actual if part of the question is how do we transition leadership, um, it's maybe useful to think about you know fractals 
How do you exchange leadership at a meeting? How do you change leadership in a rehearsal? How do you exchange leadership when you're when you're co-leading something? How do you, that's all relevant to what happens when you change leadership uh, in an institution, as in my case, where a founder left. We took a good um, five years to do that. Part of it was my figuring out that it was time to go, figuring out that a lot of that was internal. When we began, then there was a whole other set of things we had to do when it was external. Um, the number of rituals that we made and kept, I think one of the things we did that I liked the most, which is continued, it, it fed back down into the fractals, into the small things, is what are the, what's the nature of the compact? We had a, comp like a compact that we checked in on every time that had certain rules about the transition. For example, everyone would have a job when I left was in the compact, not necessarily the job they held at the moment I was leaving. That's why I went to President Crow about and said, how about tenure? Promise everybody a job, just don't tell them they can keep the job they have. I think actually it's true, right? Because people want, it's the security, but they, 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 can, they can't, otherwise the shape gets stuck. You're stuck in the shape and you need that flexibility. So those kinds of things where you understand what's the underlying thing, put that there and let the rest of it start to, so those are, um, those are my first thoughts on, on that. How about you, Mike? I'll be, I'll be short so we can get to another question, but Carol, you spoke yesterday about, uh, it was a, an amazing conversation, the three of you. It was really beautiful and a privilege to hear. <laughs> um, but you spoke about listening uh, and how important it was that folks just know that their voice is welcome and needed in the room. Mm -hmm. And that anything that, that whiffs of dismissal is, is the end of not just leadership transition, but the end of positive exchange and respect and the possibility of a future together. Um, and I, I certainly try to think about that in terms of the work we do as an organization with younger artists and older artists. Um, and I think about it as a teacher, frankly, uh, thinking about like how everything that's said in the room you know, uh, is of potential value in the room and to treat it that way and not as if it's in the way. But I'll, I'll just say that I, I think like a really strong practice of listening and respect is, is, is central to, to that conversation. So. I think it's a, an important point. I have pretty two specific thoughts on it. They're brief. One is um, I think that for as many places where that is true in the struggle you're talking about, there are many places where there is that access and that it seems to me important to be building the excellent tools for both the places that can access them right now and do the activism to try to make sure that broadband access is a part of any platform of equity right now in our country. So that, that needs to be as important to me and forces working online as making the content. But I, to me, the answer is not don't make, don't push that way because it's not there yet. I think the point is broadband access needs to be there and it is in many places and we need the content and the tools to be there. So that's, that's I, a take I, on that. No, I, I would, you. I'd also just say, yeah. uh, you know, uh, at, in Baltimore, the lead art, arts funder, the Deutsche Foundation is also the lead funder on net neutrality. 
go find out where are the people that are working on this, partner them, partner them, partner them, fund the libraries, fund the libraries, get arts pro, get in the libraries, because that's where people, if some of these places don't have libraries anymore, and which is just heartbreaking, yeah. Bob, how about if I go back there and then come to yeah. someone I can't see? It's a great question. It's one that we've dealt with for years because a lot of our work has been participatory and experience-based. So we're always trying to figure out what's the invitation that is honest and ethical and also leaves space for discovery in the process of the experience. So at USC, we got to explore with those 49 folks, sometimes telling them too much and then sometimes telling them a, a little less and always getting to debrief and get feedback after each time, which was really necessary. Um, so my answer is we are thinking about that. We think it's in the invite. Uh, that stranger chorus is curated not with an email and then sign up, but through meetings, phone calls, coffees, going to them, usually through partner organizations, not just sort of random uh, mall surveys, uh, which I heard about another thing doing, which is another story. Um, so I, I say like, yeah, that's a really crucial question and we are working on that. You know, um, yeah. we. Um, for me, it's saying every single time I teach anything, you are in charge of your body. Over, I used to say it at Dance Exchange, it, it doesn't matter if you say it, it, said it today, they won't remember. Say it again the next day. Say it again, say it again. People don't believe it. So people are in charge of their bodies and whatever else you want to add to that. And secondly, I would say critical response process is a consent-based process. It, it teaches, it says, you cannot say whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want to me. No, you can't. Here are some ways to work, though I, want, I am interested in what you have to say. So I think, and actually we're putting a lot of attention right now in that fourth step where I have an opinion about, do you want to hear it? Helping people actually practice saying no. And you, I mean, we did it recently. We just did a round, the practice of saying no. And there was uh, one of the professors in the room started crying. She said, I cannot imagine my students ever being able to do this. So we just have a lot of work to do in, in giving people that power. Yeah. Open to talking more with you about that in specifics too, if you want another time.
That's Elizabeth from Independent Eye. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, can I just, uh, that's the second time now we've heard a comment where you're getting us to make sure to check into our imagination that we're picturing white people when we talk about poorly resourced people, or in this case, this rural place. I um, approached some neuroscientists because I was interested at the time I was working with Jolly Zoller on a piece about the impact of poverty and wealth on the body. And I was interested in the fact that the statistics are such that when you talk about poor people in America, you should not just picture people of color. They're actually really poor. And I wanted, to, I wanted the neuroscientist to tell me how many, how could I change people's picture that comes to their mind? Like what would they need to see? I said, like, what if you told me that they needed to see a thousand pictures of poor white people? Would that bring them the capacity to change their mind? That change the picture? Because I'm sure that our imaginations are personalizing data every single second if we would pay attention to that. So what does it take? What does it take? What does it take? Their particular answer <laughs> disturbed me quite a bit. <laughs> They said that they thought imagination and experience were just about the same and that what you brought to mind was what your experience was. And uh, which discounts then everything we're doing <laughs> unless we can get people to say that <laughs> being with us is an experience that counts as an experience and they see a new picture in, as opposed to embodying it themselves. So it's, it gives us pause, but that is true, interesting. We have three more minutes. Questions or thoughts? PTP, Progressive Technology Project, Project in Minneapolis. Yes, and they also provide digital information, transgressive digital cash uh, for 501c3, the nonprofit. It is a nonprofit organization. So it's another organization that is you know, working to address some of these issues about poverty. Thank you. That's a great resource. Thank you. So we should be going out now. Yeah. We, we were each going to, we thought we'd uh, close just by telling you a little bit about the Southwest and what its impact has uh, been on us. Would you like to go? You want me to start? I'll start. Um, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've been uh, I'm surprisingly moved by the environment and uh, by being in the desert uh, and by the mix of people who live here. And um, I've been very much influenced by some of uh, the artists coming out of the Latinx and indigenous communities here. One, uh, one person, Cristobal Martinez, who's, who's part of uh, Post Commodity, who was here last year, who hasn't been here this year. And I've sustained this relationship, we talk a lot, but Cristobal was pretty much always on my case to slow down. Like he used to <laughs> he'd come to my office, he'd make his meetings at the end of the day, knowing that I'd have to make light rail. And then he'd say, I'll walk you to light rail. <laughs> he walks really slow. <laughs> There's no way I could catch my train. So, and <laughs> but uh, I've really been thinking a lot about the nature of time and how it, how it lives uh, in us. I heard recently of, the, of an indigenous group in uh, Australia that considers when they think about the past, they put it in front because they already know what it was. And they think about what... The, what behind us. I just love that. Totally uprooting for me personally. But I was in the car listening, you know, I listen to Radio Lab occasionally and it's so weird because I always just catch a fragment of Radio Lab. I never hear the whole Radio Lab. But this and I like it better that way because they're kind of annoying, but the the <laughs> <laughs> but the information's so interesting. So this one was about the fact that the earth used to spin faster and then we got a moon and we slowed down like by about a second or something. I mean, it's some tiny infinitesimal that we did slow down. And so I, I, um, I told Cristobal the other day that I'm, I'm working on having a moon and just carrying a moon with me. And it's little, so I, when people are going really fast, I might go like this. 
get a moon. And I encourage everybody to take one with you. And that's part of this dreamy kind of space that I feel we've been given by being here. It's fun to see her do that in meetings. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, I'm going to be super, super quick because Alicia needs the space. And I'll just say uh, uh, I moved here after 10 years in Chicago, which was after almost 10 years in Portland, Oregon. Um, and uh, this is a pretty amazing um, place to get to live. Um, and I, the, 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 the natural landscape, I probably think about more because I have two little kids. So I get to take them outside all year in a way that I didn't get to so much in Chicago. And the natural beauty here is incredible. Um, but I'm more, I more register change of place in terms of people than landscape, mm -hmm. just personally. Uh, and um, it's really different than living in Chicago. It's, uh, it's r Chicago's a really complicated place. Phoenix is, in my experience, 10 times more complicated, this region, for many reasons. And the artist community, and the organizer and activist community, and the justice community, all of those, of course, are threaded together and around each other. Um, there is a deep, a deep set of commitments and purposes at play, a deep and appropriate wariness of outsiders, um, and a, uh, a really uh, intense dialogue about the pace that change needs to occur at. And in the spaces where change is really happening here, uh, particularly in the last year, uh, it is not a patient space. Nor should it be a patient space. It is not a patient space. And that is powerful to be around and be challenged by and think about and try to support. That's great. Slow down and speed up. <laughs> That's a perfect place. Thank you, guys. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.